embracing the future with faith is like the theme of my life. Like I feel like every couple of years I have a big experience that reminds me that I need to look at the future, trusting in the Lord's plan instead of my own plan. And in having those experiences, I've gathered kind of three tools that I've used to apply as I have more experiences down the road, because that's what life is, right? We're continually growing. So these three tools that I've kind of compilated are the first being kind of stop being where you're at. If it's chaotic, like we mentioned before, to stop and look for the Lord's hand in the daily things, like the small blessings in your life that provides a lot of peace and ability to process. So look for those little details when you feel like you're struggling to see what your future may be, or it's uncertain or undesirable at the moment. That's one. Two, go forward and persevere. I remember a seminary teacher telling me, (laughs) related to dating, and I'll get into that in a minute, but God can't steer a parked car. So you have to move forward, got to keep going forward, persevere. So that's the second thing I've learned and tried to embrace the future with me. The third is to surround yourself with people that can help buoy you up, lift you up when you have moments or thoughts of doubt and disbelief in the Lord taking your life in the direction it's supposed to be. So those are my three things. And to illustrate it, I'm going to give some very personal experiences on how I learned those three lessons to embrace the future. First, I'm going to back up to my life, who I was as a high schooler. So high school Cambridge saw herself as an athlete. I did gymnastics. I did ballet. I was on my high school diving team. I did cheerleading. I was just very into athletics and it made me feel unstoppable. I also participated in a sport called equestrian ball team. And it's a little bit of an obscure sport, not something that most people are aware of, but it is It's a little bit like circus. It is gymnastics and dance performed on the back of your moving horse. So essentially the horse has equipment on on their back. So a pad and handle strapped around the horse. And then someone leads the horse, directs the horse in a circle. It can be at walk, trot, or a canter or a gallop, I guess is a better word to say, in a circle. And then the athlete, so myself at the time, would hop on the horse and perform gymnastics and dance and you could perform it as an individual a double or in this picture you can see all three of us this is the team division and that was truly where my passion lied I loved being actually the person upside down on the top is me in this picture I loved that adrenaline of doing something athletic and and really feeling unstoppable as a senior in high school so I did this all growing up as a senior in high school I had mapped in my head all of my future. Like I knew exactly what my future was going to be like. I was going to graduate high school. I was going to go to BYU and at BYU, I would find my future husband and I'd probably get married then. And then I would go to a grad school and I would become a pediatric dentist. And then by the time I was 35, my husband and I would have four children and we'd live happily ever after. Simple, right? Like that, what senior Cambry 18 year old thought life was going to be like. I was on the right track. I'd been accepted into BYU and I knew exactly what I wanted. So there was no stopping me. Well, what I didn't plan was two weeks after graduation, I was practicing with my teammates doing our, our ball team, our equestrian gymnastics. And I didn't communicate with my teammate and they went for my dismount off the horse. So I went for an aerial and I hit my teammate with my back leg, changed my rotation in the air, and then landed in a position on my back that um, severed my spinal cord. And (laughs) this was 16 years ago, and I still get a little emotional. I I remember lying there on the ground thinking, what? What happened? I can't feel my legs anymore. I can't move my legs. What's going on? And... And, and kind of giving myself some reassurance in the moment, like, oh, it's okay. You'll probably have to go to physical therapy and it'll be a rough year, but then you'll be right back where you were. So when the doctor came in and told me that I broke my back and severed my spiral cord and I never walk again, that really was one of those moments where I felt broken. I was physically broken and I felt 
spiritually, emotionally, mentally broken in that moment. I remember one particular day, a few weeks after hearing that I was paralyzed, while I was in the rehab, I went to a physical therapy appointment. And while I was in there, we were working on a mat at the edge of a mat, kind of like a, a table. And I was working on my balance, just sitting there without using my hands to hold arms the mat. So we were playing, I think, patty cake, or we we're tossing a ball back and forth. We're just working on that balance. And I remember it not being easy and falling over frequently. And I remember the thought in my brain being, who are you? <laughs> You're a broken version of what you used to be. <laughs> like, I have no idea what your future holds anymore. And I had a, a bit of a pity party for myself. Uh, I went back to my hospital room and my mom saw me that way. And she said, I think it's time we go on a field trip. <laughs> I remember thinking, a field trip? I'm stuck in the hospital here. Like, where are we going? And she said, we need to go to another wing at the hospital. So she pushed me to the other side of the hospital where we ended up at the traumatic brain injury ward. And I saw a girl outside her hospital room in a wheelchair as well. But she was wearing a helmet and she was able to walk. But it wasn't coordinated well, and she wasn't able to speak. She just kind of had kind of like baby talk, just a little bit like garbled and not very clear. And the sentence didn't make sense. And her traumatic brain injury made it difficult for her to, to speak. And in that moment, I realized that I needed to stop dwelling on the moment and what I didn't have and how horrible my life was at the moment and how I didn't know what my future would be anymore and that I needed to be grateful in the moment for what I did have. And that is my first point of looking at the small things in your daily life, being able to speak, being able to go to school. I remember starting to look around me in the hospital and trying to find blessings every day. One of the first blessings that I recognized was my rehabilitation doctor. She was in a wheelchair. <laughs> like, who, who has a female doctor in a wheelchair? I did. She showed me that she could be successful in the life that she led. And she was beautiful and drove a fancy car and had a great life. And that could be my future. Another blessing I recognized was that my family, we had just moved to the Bay Area, which is where I had my accident. And I had, the year prior we had moved there, and I had a bunch of friends in the area. I had family in the area. They were able to visit me and help keep me happy and alive and focused on, on what I did have. I had a ton of blessings that I was able to pick out in those first couple of months. And anytime I started to kind of slip back into the fear and not the face of my future, I was able to pick out more blessings. It led me to, to really realize that the Lord was present in my daily life. And if he was present in my daily life, he was going to be there for my future. Fast forward a little bit down the road. When I went to school, I did go to BYU, but dental school just didn't resonate with me anymore. It didn't seem like that's where I needed to go. So I switched schools. I went to VU and I didn't know what I was doing, but I kept going to school. I persevered. I kept going forward and was hoping that the Lord would steer my mind in the direction, my study in the direction, and as to what career I was supposed to take to make the biggest impact on others that I could or my family that I could. And that's when I started to get phone calls from a hospital nearby, and they initially invited me to come and speak to a young lady that had been in a skiing accident. And she was kind of feeling the same frustrations and fear of the unknown of her future as well. And I thought, <clears throat> excuse me, yeah, of course I can come and speak with her. And I planned on just being there for about 30 minutes to, to converse with her and give her a little bit of insight. And what was supposed to be 30 minutes ended up the entire day. 
visiting hours were over and they had to kick me out. She had so many wonderful questions. She asked about dating. She asked about navigating school. She asked about how to get dressed, how to get in and out of a car, all these daily activities. And that's when I realized that I loved doing that. And that role is actually called an occupational therapist. And that's when I continued my education, switched majors, and applied to the University of Utah and became an occupational therapist. And a few years later, I ended up being a pediatric occupational therapist and worked with the pediatric population. Many children with various different disabilities that I was able to relate to and provide comfort to them and their family as well. Not something I had envisioned at 18, but so grateful that I persevered, kept going to school. I was in school for 10 years before I graduated. And I'm so grateful that I just kept going and trucking along and the Lord directed me in the direction that was best for my future and those around me. Okay, this leads to my third point in experience. So as I became an occupational therapist, I realized in the, po- in the pediatric population, I realized that I wasn't really meeting men. And I was still single at this point. I was 30 years old and knew I wanted to be a wife and a mother someday and wasn't sure why it hadn't happened yet. So I I kind of found myself in a bit of a funk. I wasn't sure if that was in the cards for me anymore and possibly my wheelchair was the reason why I hadn't found someone. And I kind of slipped into this, yeah, this funk where I didn't feel like I was progressing. I started to kind of feel sorry for myself and my future felt bleak. I lost that that faith. And that's when I had friends kind of rally around me and suggest that I go to the temple. And I went two to three times a week. I was an overachiever, I felt. And I went for months at a time and I first felt that funk lift and felt peace. You can absorb what's going on around you and be kind of stuck in that chaos or you can choose to have peace. And going to the temple provided that peace for me. I was able to get courage and, and direction and signed up for a dating app. Not something I had wanted to do, but felt prompted to do and with the support of my family and friends did. And I didn't just casually go on dates. I aggressively went on dates. I pushed forward and persevered. I went on a lot of miserable dates and I went on some great dates. I went on some par dates. I went on lots of dates for about a year. I was going on a lot of dates and I found myself on the front porch of a little crepery on a date one night with a particular man that the conversation just flowed. It felt like we understood each other and I was so excited. And then he leaned over and looked around the table and looked at my wheelchair. And I know that he, you know, he didn't go on a blind date not knowing I was in a wheelchair, but it just kind of like stopped the conversation when he leaned over and looked at my wheelchair and I I was nervous. I was I was worried that maybe he would see it as a limitation. And while we were having our conversation, he had maybe forgotten about it and that a second date might not be in the cards for us. But after he looked around the table at my wheelchair, his comment was so what more, like upgrades can we do to your wheelchair? Have you done anything extra to it? And I knew that he wasn't looking at me as as like a limitation or a barrier to his future. He was looking at my wheelchair as an opportunity to create and to have an adventure, like something new. And that date turned into a second date and a third date and a fourth date and so on for about a six month till we got married or got engaged and then got married. And that is my husband. So to recap on all of that, 
18-year-old Cambry thought she had her life figured out. She knew that she was going to go to BYU, which I did, but I didn't graduate from. I actually went to the University of Utah. She knew she was going to be a pediatric dentist, which I didn't become. I became an occupational therapist. I was going to get married in college. I didn't. I was 30, actually 32 by the time I got married. And I was going to have four children by the time I was 35. We just had our first child and I am 34 and a half. So don't think three more children are coming before 35. But my point is my future totally changed. I did not plan on being in a wheelchair. I did not plan on, on my life going the way that it did. But man, am I grateful that it did. I am so grateful that my unknown future became something that I couldn't even create in my mind. It was so much better. It is so much better. And in clothing, I just want to also add another little tidbit of when we feel like our future is uncertain or difficult or we're just not going to make it through. I want, I want us to be able to reflect on past experiences where life didn't go as planned, but instead it became something better and greater. And I think that ability of reflecting can help as well. So looking for the Lord in your daily activities, going forward with faith and persevering, surrounding yourself with people that provide you peace and lead you in the right direction and reflecting upon those experiences to get you through to a brighter future. And I say things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.